It will help monitor progress towards domestic and European targets, and it will hopefully raise public awareness of waste management issues. So, where are we now? Well, we currently produce around 17 million tonnes of waste in Scotland every year, and of that, 15% is from households, 41% from commerce and industry, and 44% from the construction and demolition sector. And as regards the management of waste, pleased to see that landfills coming down, overall recycling is well on the way up, and incineration is, is fairly steady. So what were some of the issues that we found with the data that we needed to address by the strategy? Well, as far as local authority collected waste was concerned, uh, the main issues identified were the, the change in definition from ha household waste to waste from households, and also the issue about how to split household and commercial from mixed collection rounds, and also the government's carbon metric, how we can supply data for the, for the carbon metric. The commercial industrial waste data, um, the main issue there is having accurate data on arisings by economic sector and also another issue is, well for, for all waste really, when waste is managed outside Scotland it's very difficult for us to track it and to quantify it so that's quite a big challenge for us too. Construction and demolition waste data, that's actually quite good because it comes from existing uh, waste management returns, we have ownership of those and very little of it leaves the country so we have a really good um, handle on construction and demolition waste data. Um, there's always the, the issue as with other data, the coding of waste could be improved to give us more, more accurate information. And then special waste, um, that's a paper based system at the moment which obviously has many challenges, CEPA receives about 100,000 paper notes every year that we have to deal with and analyse and, and input um, and also the quality of the information that's actually written on the consignment notes um, isn't always as good as it should be so that uh, you know, detracts from the quality of the data too. So, where do we want to be? We want to be able to produce high quality, robust data on all waste streams. We want to know how and where all Scottish waste is managed. We want to be able to provide information in line with the waste hierarchy that will encourage the development of infrastructure for maximising resource use. We need to meet statutory reporting obligations, zero waste plan requirements and those of the key data users. And we need to understand how waste flows through the system. So this is a diagram illustrating what it is. This is what we need to know. Uh, we want to know where and how all the waste produced is managed and transformed into resource that's placed back into the production, distribution and consumption markets. The flow through the system, if we can get a mass balance of, of how all this works, that will be really uh, the ultimate goal. So coming on to the, the high priorities that were identified by the strategy, there were 23 outcomes identified overall and 11 of them were identified as high priority. And this is just a summary of those high priority um, outcomes. We need improved data on commercial and industrial waste arising and management, as I've said previously. Uh, we need good data on household waste to monitor the waste framework directive and zero waste plan targets. We need robust quality assurance systems. We need to improve the information on the final destination of waste, particularly when it leaves Scotland. Uh, we need to be able to report on individual material streams. We need improved data on waste imports and exports. And we need the right data to feed into the gov government's carbon metric for all waste. So now I'm going to spend a little bit more detail about the, the one outcome on 
improving the quality of commercial industrial waste horizons and management as an example of, of how we're going to approach these outcomes. Um, in the long term, we're looking for the commercial industrial waste data to come from the, the UK electronic duty of care system. Um, this is a system currently, just a project that's just started, and it's the idea of replacing paper waste transfer notes with electronic records that are all held in a central database. Uh, if you want any more information about that, there are some handouts on the CEPA stand which give an overview of the project. In the short to medium term, we're moving away from business waste surveys, which we've done in the past, and going to use waste management data that we currently hold in order to produce the waste horizons and management data. Um, the graph there is showing business waste horizons over the last five years, and this is data that's come from the business waste surveys that CEPA has that carried out over the last few years. How are we going to use existing returns to, to quantify the horizons of management of commercial industrial waste? Well, we, we've produced a methodology which will hopefully provide this data at least from 2011 up to 2016. We, we've set that timescale because we think the, the electronic duty of care system is likely to be rolled out in early 2015. So we want to give two or three years for the data to, to you know, really solidify and improve before we actually start using that data for uh, horizons of management. Um, so we're going to use existing waste management returns, that's quarterly site returns, and also exempt activity returns. Um, it should be the most accurate source of data, and it's certainly a well-established data collection system, so there's a lot of merits with, with using that data. And the, the really good thing about it is the arisings of management data will come from the same source in the future. So we should have a good correlation between the two. Because when we've done business waste surveys, we've, we've used that for arisings and the management has come from uh, site returns data. So they're two different sources, so there's a, a very poor correlation between those. But in the future we're hoping that correlation is going to be much better. As with any data collection system, there are always issues. Uh, the main issue for us is that we need the economic sector of, that's producing the waste. We need that for the European reporting and the government also want that information. Um, at the moment that is not available, although the, um, the draft zero waste regs were suggesting that the standard industry classification of businesses will be a requirement of waste transfer notes in the future. And certainly they've just introduced that um, in England and Wales uh, last month. Um, and this is, that would be like a forerunner to the electronic duty of care, that information would be very vital for, for, the, for getting it all ready for the electronic duty of care. Um, the other issue we have if we're using site return data, obviously because waste moves around from one site to another, that we need to be sure that we're eliminating any double counting. And the methodology that we have, we believe, will eliminate double counting, but we just need to be very aware of that, that issue. So what have we done so far? Well, we set up a stakeholder group and we've had a couple of meetings. Um, the stakeholder group involves CISA, the government, COSLA, local authorities, business organisations, Scottish Enterprise, Zero Waste Scotland. So it's, it's quite a large group and we've talked about our ideas with them. Um, we've developed a methodology for calculating waste arisings. Um, we now want to work with one or two waste management companies to see what's the best way to estimate the, the economic sector producing the waste because it's not a requirement at the moment. So we're wanting to approach the largest companies in early uh, 2012 and ask them to help us to estimate the economic sector producing the waste. Uh, our research shows that there are about 70 companies that handle more than 80% of the waste in Scotland. So we're not planning to go to all companies, we're just going to target a small group of companies that are handling the majority of the waste. And of those, uh, 15 are local authorities, and other of them deal with specific types of industries. So the, there's the rail industry and water and power, and the oil and gas industry and demolition. So we think 
some of those companies, it's going to be very easy to assign the economic sector for the waste that, that they're handling as well. So we're hoping that's not going to be too difficult to task. And the ultimate aim is to produce data on commercial industrial waste horizons and management for 2011 by the summer of 2012, which is going to be quite challenging for us. And one of the um, issues that we really need to address is to get getting in all the site returns data from all the waste management facilities very promptly so that we can analyse the data. Okay, so the last slide is how will the strategy be delivered. Um, we're going to be working very closely with Zero Waste Scotland to coordinate the strategy. We're going to set up working groups to tackle specific issues, just like we have with the commercial industrial waste, as an example. Um, many of the outcomes will be delivered through our and other partners' day-to-day -day work. Um, we'll also be trying to influence others to improve or share more data. And we're going to establish a technical advisory group um, that will review the waste data products and provide feedback and help to improve the quality or the type of data that, that we produce. And that is the end, and that's the link for the waste data strategy. Um, you have received questionnaires as you came in about waste data. Um, what we plan to do over the next six months is to review the waste data digest that we produce, our website, the types of information that we're producing. Um, so any feedback that you can provide would be very helpful. Um, questions can be collected at the end or you can put them in the box on the seat stand. Thank you.
but not fall in the jet. In terms of what's making that happen, um, I don't think you can talk about trends, data trends without mentioning landfill tax. That's certainly what's been driving things away from landfill. <coughs> we'll continue to do so. Um, we're sitting at just over £50 a tonne landfill tax at the moment, with an escalator that will take us up to £80 a tonne. Um, so I think we can see that this particular driver is going to continue to move things away from landfill and um, continue to drive the change in the nature of the infrastructure that we need and that we have. Look at the amount of waste that we do landfill and the capacity that we have now. If you went back 10 years, put up a slide like this, we'd actually be the envy of most parts of the UK because at current or 2009 infill rates, we've got about 16 years landfill capacity, and that would be considered, would have been considered, to have been a good place to be. We've got sufficient time to plan for what we're going to need beyond that period, and we've got no immediate likelihood of a shortfall. And other parts of the UK uh, would not be in that position. But I hope to show you in a few slides' time that actually this is a potential liability. This is something that we have to manage and reduce because if you look ahead on the next slide, we'll show you uh, the zero waste plan targets. If you look ahead to 2025, when the government would like us to be landfilling a maximum of 5% of our waste, then at the moment we would have 75 years of capacity left in landfill, and that brings problems with it that I'll come on to in a minute. So these are the key points from the Zero Waste Plan. High recycling and low landfill. Um, and really what that's going to mean for us is as far as collection of wastes go, we're going to have an increasing amount of source segregated dry recyclables. And those are going to be banned from going directly to landfill. They will have to go uh, for recycling or through MERVs with the rejects only going to landfill. And we'll have source segregated food waste collections or possibly coming in with food waste, green waste collections, and these will go for some form of biostabilization treatment. Again, a ban on that going directly to landfill. So we've got the landfill tax driving things down, changing where we put our wastes, we've got the zero waste plan setting very high level targets um, and we've got zero waste regulations coming at the end of this year in all probability uh, which will mean the start of bans on materials going to landfill and uh, a requirement for people to start sort of segregating them to already doing so. So this is where we are with waste going to landfill and where we've come from when you talk about only 5% of our waste going to landfill and we're sitting at 60 something percent at the moment, it seems like a massive shift. And it is a big shift. And it is a big challenge. But look at where we came from before we had the landfill tax. And we had almost as much waste going to landfill as the total amount of waste, waste that is now produced in Scotland and 16 million tonnes. And the landfill tax came in and stuff that was easy to take out. And construction demolition waste in particular came out early on and led to an early drop. There's been considerable efforts uh, by large parts of the, of the industry, both the private and the public, uh, to continue to drive material away from landfill. So we're now in a position where we're just over 4 million tonnes of waste going to landfill in a year. If you look at the continuation, I've just projected on a steady decline. 2009 to where we want to be in 2025. <coughs> it doesn't actually look to me as bad when you see it like this. When you see where we've come from, what we've achieved, <coughs> what you guys have achieved really, is because we have a very small part to play. And um, what we've achieved to date, we can get the rest of it. But there are challenges and there are implications in terms of the infrastructure we already have. And there are opportunities there as well. By 2025, based on the current waste horizons, we will 
who are combined for no more than 0.85 million tons a year. Um, so where's the rest of the waste going to go? Um, three to three and a half million tons a year is going to either have to not be produced in the first place, which would be the ideal situation, or realistically, it's going to have to be redirected on another way of dealing with it. That gives business opportunities, gives the opportunity for people to capture that, to fund the infrastructure that needs to be built, gives a chance for existing sites to adapt, to take in additional waste, additional revenue streams, but it brings the challenges with it as well, in terms of going from where we are to where we want to be. Type of waste we have is going to change. As I showed you earlier, the site is going to be much more soil segregated. And we still have the challenge of what are we going to do with the one to one and a half million tons of residual waste, which is going to be left after we've, after we've collected those materials that we want so segregated, what are we going to do with what remains? So the challenges for existing sites, um, I mentioned the waste stream is going to change throughput is going to change, so the technologies are going to change, um, and it's difficult, it's harder to retrofit uh, a new technology to an existing site than it is to design it from scratch. There's more barriers, there's more constraints on what you can do, on the amount of land you have available, um, where you can store materials, what buildings you have, etc. Um, so that's, that's a challenge, but some of the sites this is going to be a chance to increase what they take. Some of them are going to adapt um, and thrive through this. And others, the landfills in particular, it's a different story. So we're going to have to deal with the changing waste streams, the changing throughputs. We're going to have to learn to deal with rejects. When we get people to source segregate, they don't tend to get it right on day one. It's very interesting listening to Ken Donnelly and seeing you know, lessons to be learned there and trying to get people to do the right thing right at the start of the new project um, because that does away with part of this problem. But most rejects go to landfill at the moment. If that's not going to be an option in the future, as it may well not be, but certainly for some of them, we have to learn how to reintegrate those back into our systems. I mentioned we've got residual waste to deal with and we have to be honest in terms of what technologies there are available to do that. Um, and how we're going to handle it. But what I now want to focus on is how we manage the transition. How we take all these challenges and opportunities and actually make them work from where we are now. Because some of the sites are going to change in terms of the volumes of waste that they get, the types of waste they get, the types of technologies that they use. Some of the sites are going to have to close. We have 54 landfill sites in Scotland that take non hazardous waste. Uh, municipal type waste to get from household or commercial or industrial sources. We don't need the four landfill sites going forward. Um, there are already many of them struggling to get insufficient waste to keep pace with their current development plans. Um, so those all need to be revisited to see what do we actually need? How do we get those that we don't need closed? Because we want it to happen without having some environmental impact. If you just go, we're not giving any more waste into the landfill site. This is the, the approach the Germans and the Danes took to ban and biodegradable waste from landfill. They just switched it off like that. One day you could take it, one day if it was above the total organic content of 5%, you couldn't. I'm not saying the policy is wrong, but the implementation is wrong because you talk to the regulators from those two countries, they tell you they have huge operational problems, the landfill sites that had open cells a long way from restoration profiles, they couldn't get the material in, they couldn't get the sites finished off, so you get a lot of problems generated in relation to that. We need the change to be affordable, we need it to be affordable in terms of business who want to invest, we need it to be affordable to local authorities who have to collect the waste and deliver it and, um, and pay for its, its treatment and management in some we need it to be affordable as a wider society um, in terms of the benefits that we get from this change have to be shown to outweigh uh, the difficulty and challenges that, uh, that arise from it. Um, we really need it to be properly planned and we need that to 
pattern there. And although some of you um, are doing that, but there's some very good examples. Um, Chris Ewing, five council, was sitting down there. Chris is, a, is ahead of me in terms of thinking about this because he's implementing some of these changes um, through what they're, they're doing. Other local authorities are doing the same. Other private sector companies are looking at what they can adapt, how they can adapt, what they've got to the public health unit. But not everybody's doing it, and it needs to, to uh, really be thought through. So back to the landfill sites again, because as I said, these are the sites with the biggest consequences. If we reduce the amount of waste that goes to landfill, and please, can I stress that I, CEPA, and I personally are fully on board with that happening, as a policy drive, as a policy position, it's entirely right. It's how we get there that I'm concerned about. Um, because if we have all these sites scrambling over small amounts of waste, such as we increase their lifespan, we have cells that are open longer than they were designed for, we increase the leach generation, we've got changing waste compositions, we've got cells that take longer to fill, we can't get permanent gas extraction extraction into those cells so we're going to get a greater chance of local load problems, biggest problem we have with landfills in Scotland, biggest source of complaints to see but we're going to get changes in gas generation rates as a, as a composition changes so have we actually got the existing uh, flexibility within our landfill gas extraction systems to manage that? If they've been built predicting on 2009 rates, 2009 compositions, this is the gas we're expecting. We're not going to get that. So we need systems to be developed or amended now to give us the flexibility to be able to still continue to capture the gas which is going to be generated from the waste that's going in today for the next 30 years. Um, but people have got to be thinking that to take into account the changes. We need smaller cell size. We don't need people coming to us saying, I deliver waste to, the, to my site in large part trucks, so therefore uh, I need a big turning circle. Sorry, that's not going to wash and change it how you deliver the waste to the site or have a reception area and transport it up within the area in a smaller vehicle. Um, so there's going to be changes in practices for some people as well. We need every site to review its restoration plans and profiles and consider whether they are still achievable. And that's something that CEPA will be going to every landfill operator to discuss over the next year or two to say, right, what are your long term plans for this site? Is it continuing? Is it closing? If it's closing, show us how you're going to do it, show us the time to go, you're going to do it to, and let's work out how we can do it with a minimum environmental impact. If you stay open, demonstrate to us how you're going to manage the changes that are going to have to take place within your site. And the bottom point, let's be quite honest, we don't need every landfill site that we have. We will need considerably fewer. Um, for those of you who've been regulated by CEPA, um, this is not our only understanding of landfills. This is just a simple illustration of some of the problems I've talked about. Um, the requirement for a mineral layer is not going to change cost of it is not going to change. The requirement for an HTTP or similar liner is not going to change, and the cost of it is not going to change. So the cost of developing those landfills that stay open is not going to go down. The leachate collection system is probably going to be the same as the leachate management system. It's going to have to deal with more leachate of different composition, possibly weaker in some respects. Um, so there may be a trade off there, but certainly capacity wise, you're going to have more of the stuff to deal with. But you're not going to fill it up as quickly. It's going to take more time. So you're not going to have as much revenue coming in as you do at the moment. And the composition is going to change. So when we want you to put in a gas extraction system, you can't base it on what's happened. In fact, every gas extraction system that's gone into a landfill site in Scotland has been based on looking at past data. Yeah. We, know, we understand how waste that has been landfilled for the last 20, 30, 40 years, we understand how that breaks down and we understand how much gas is likely to give us. We don't understand the amount of gas we get going forward, but we need to get up to speed with that very quickly. Um, 
So you've got the same costs, <coughs> you've got some difficulties uh, in relation to your infrastructure, some of it may actually increase in costs of your operating costs in relation to gas extraction, the check management may go up, but your waste stream is going to go down. Uh, eventually, we get to the point of being filled um, and we cap it. Um, and there's a question in relation to where some of those materials are going to come from. So I think there's going to be almost a presumption, um, or there should be a presumption, that costing might suggest that uh, caps are not going to be from imported materials. They're going to have to be bought in. Um, so in summary, the first point here, I'm not telling you anything that you haven't heard from other speakers at the time, you haven't heard elsewhere, and if you haven't realised the significant changes coming in the industry, then uh, I'd be quite surprised. Um, the second point, I hope it's self-evident, because we've got a significant transition in infrastructure, and it isn't all about what do we want, do we want AD or do we want vessel composting and what type of thermal treatment do we want and what level of efficiency? These are all important questions, but you can't lose sight of the fact that we have an infrastructure, we have waste horizons. During the whole of the transition period, we will continue to have those waste horizons and they will continue to have to be dealt with. And we have to make that transition whilst ensuring good environmental performance right across the piece. But the third point is thing that I really want to stress and I want to leave you with is this is happening now. This is not happening in 2013, 2020, 2025 on all the days that set out in the zero waste plan. This is happening now because if it isn't happening now and it isn't being planned for now, then it's not going to happen properly. Thank you. Um, 
basically, I work in the west of Scotland, and um, for those who work around the west of Scotland, you can check those out of the sky and go to Red Ink. The sales, we, we have, we change different amounts in Scotland because of the amount of rainfall that we get. And the longer these sales stay open, with less waste going into the, they collect more rainfall, there's less waste um, to absorb it, and therefore there's going to be more free liquid within the cell. We're aiming to finish five minutes early so we can get first in the launch queue, but we've still got uh, we still got another five minutes till we get to that point. So uh, Robert will be enough there's a good question to send you. There's a second last slide that you mentioned uh, uh, early twenty twelve to, to catch up with C9 data. Yes. Uh, which you, I think you mentioned some challenges. And it's, that's a fairly optimistic view that you're really not holding that by you know, in the next six months and being in mind the past trade and that, that information really was not readily available. So how do you how do you feel you're gonna get there so quickly now? By putting a lot of resources into this, by chasing um, returns and by using est estimating the uh, economic sector because we're not expecting <coughs> Straight away. So um, yeah, we, we, we've got a, a plan of how we're going to, to do this, but it's going to take a lot of effort from a lot of people to actually bring it to fruition. But it's it's setting us on this path of, of producing data more timely. Um, what will the second thing? Sorry. What will the second thing? There's just a question of um, things like SRC codes on duty care and special waste notes, you're saying that you want that to be in the draft of the zero waste regulations um, on the side, are the zero waste regulations going to be available for us to comment on? There was some consultation on them, was it earlier this year? Yeah, and there were changes
Are there any more questions? Okay, in which case we'll definitely make it to the front of lunch queue. Um, so just like to thank you for your attendance and for your questions. And um, Cindy and I will be around the secret stand if you have anything else that you'd like to talk to us about. Thanks very much.